Hello everyone, welcome back to the Christ Buddha GP podcast and we have a new World Championship leader as Peko Bagnaya made it four Grand Prix wins in a row at the Saxon Ring with a little bit of help from Jorge Martin after he crashed out with two laps to go after being lead. Yeah, drama in MotoGP. We have Mar- Marquez and Alex Marquez on the podium. Incredible scenes and we're going to pick everything from the weekend. It was very dramatic and joining me is Rob Jones and Pete McLaren. Pete, where do we start with that? It was a dramatic weekend from the start, really. We had a lot of stuff with Mar- Marquez, Mark Vinales having big crashes, and then it all just seemed to be going to plan for Jorge Martin. And then, in the blink of an eye, he loses the World Championship lead to Peko Bagnaya. Really, yeah, at the worst possible time, too, before the summer break. Yeah, early wedding present for Pecco, wasn't it, in the end? Um, I mean, it was all shaping up to be a great last lap battle. It looked like Pecco was closing in on Martin. And uh, yeah, it looked like Martin just overdid it into turn one. We don't know exactly what happened there because Martin said he's he hasn't had a chance to look at it yet and the data and exactly what went wrong. But most of the other riders seem to think that it's just one of those corners, isn't it? It's a critical corner. And if you overdo it into there, you've either got to commit or you've got to stand the bike up. Martin committed and it looked like it, uh, well, obviously it just caught him out there at the end. So as you say, kind of the weekend was a tale of two right-hand corners, wasn't it? It was the one, the turn 11 with Mark Marquez on Friday and then turn one at the end of the race. And those two moments probably conditioned uh, the outcome, didn't they? Because the only rider that was matching Pecco and uh, and uh, Martin at the end of the race for speed was was Mark Marquez. But obviously he was starting too far back. I'm sure we'll get onto that later. But, but back to Pecco, yeah, exactly what he needed, wasn't it? I mean, he's looking to build momentum, the championship lead has changed. Okay, you know, Peck is playing it down as 10 points. It's practically zero, you know, as he, as he says, with so much of the season left. But it was about that momentum, wasn't it? Martin had stopped him in the sprint race, been really smart with his strategy. But Pecco again, learns from it, comes out. And it was, uh, it was impressive how Pecco he wasn't sort of goaded into pushing too hard when the Pramax overtook him, sort of about one third distance, was he? He stuck to his plan, maybe gave him that little bit of tire at the end that then allowed him to put that pressure on Martin and... Uh, we all know what happened then. So, yeah, big blow for uh, for Martin, obviously. But certainly not a, not, a, not a knockout blow. No, it's not. It's not. But it's it's at the worst possible time, isn't it, Rob? You know, think back to Mugello. He pretty much had near a Grand Prix's worth of sprint than Grand Prix points to cover Bagnaia. And Bagnaia's clawed it all back on him. And, yeah, after winning the sprint for Martin, to have this happen with two laps to go and that, I think that is the, the crucial thing it had happened with me 15 laps to go you could have said oh well you know it, it was just a mistake but for it to happen with just yeah two laps to go it, it's a tough one for him to take isn't it yeah and I think to your point you know to have led every lap as well you know to, to have been that dominant to have won the sprint and to, to essentially I know Banyai was quick at the end and was putting that pressure on but I think once he got under a second behind, it got to about seven, eight, ten. So it sort of stabilised. And Martin, you know, it didn't look like he was on the limit at the time, but he was obviously setting a really, really strong pace. But maybe he was pushing a little bit too much, and obviously that mistake came. But I think for him, you know, it's we've seen this too many times now. You know, Indonesia was where it really, really came to to the fore and was as the big the first real big mistake last season when he was dominating that race, again, leading every lap, taking the championship lead on the, the Saturday before with his sprint win, then crashing in the Grand Prix, giving the advantage back to Banyaya, then having a huge gap at Jerez earlier this season, crashing yeah. from the lead, leading every lap. You know, he seems to have these races where it's all under control. And for, for one reason or the other, he's, he's just making a mistake at the most crucial yeah. moment. And every time... Banyaya has won all three of those races when Martinez made the mistake. So Banyaya is always there. We know he's always there. He's always there to take advantage if you're making a mistake. And I think for Martin, knowing that Banyaya is just never going away is potentially part of the problem. Why he's pushing so much and why he feels like he has to be perfect every lap of every weekend just to try and win. And I think we're seeing those sorts of cracks where trying to ride on that sort of limit is nearly yeah. impossible and it's just a massive massive error that like pete said the championship is pretty much even like we're starting again from zero but it's the momentum and it's the fact that i think banyai will feel like he has a hold over martin yeah. now 
I, I like the point you've made, even about last year, Rob. Um, the Indonesia one was arguably there's a few moments last year what cost him the world title, but that one where he had so much in hand, he was a, like a two, three second lead he had, and then just just crisis, and you're like, oh, how has this happened? He's been so picture perfect every single lap. And it happened. Even thinking back to last year, I think back to Phillip Island as well. It was a tire problem where he had burnt out. He had picked for the the softer tire, and then everyone else went for the, the I think it was the medium or the hard option. And he didn't need to do it because he was so much faster than everyone else. And this is the thing: little mistakes, like you say, her F this year crashing out of the lead. Now it's happened. I just seriously think there's a mentality wise like you say being on that edge every single time it's great when you're on it and you're on the right side of it but when you just go over it it's catastrophic because like like pete said about bagnaya sticking to his plan where he could see yeah they're maybe gonna come back to me bagnaya just focused on that but martin's approach of just being perfect every single lap i think it's costing him and he doesn't really need to be doing it but who am I to say? I, I'm not a MotoGP rider. I don't ride the bikes every week. But yeah, I just see it as another big, big missed opportunity for Martin to kind of take momentum back from Bagnaia because he did stop that rot of Bagnaia winning every race in the sprint. And then to throw it away in the Grand Prix, yeah, I, I think it's a, a, a real missed opportunity. And, and just one more thing to add as well is when we've seen Bagnaia's errors, they've usually been in the sprint and he's come back and learned from it. Martin's errors are in the Grand Prix when all the points are available and the pressure is on. And that seems to be where, you know, he's essentially chucking wins away, which he's done on three occasions. And like you said, that was a good point about Australia. He was so fast in that race, but he would have been just as fast, if not the fastest rider, if he'd gone for the same yeah. tire compound as, as everyone else. Uh, so it's just... For Martin, I think there's some serious sort of thinking that needs to take place in the summer break of how he's going to approach the second half of the season and how he's going to approach the Grand Prix because he can't go on, you know, throwing wins away at this. And it, in a way, it just enhances Ducati's decision every every time he does yeah, it. It does. And you have to say they would take everything like that into consideration, you know, because, yeah, it's, it's a real tough one for him. That's all I have to say on it. I think that's... It's just, it's there for us to see what happened. I, I couldn't believe it when I seen it on the little, because it wasn't even on the main broadcast. It was on the little box yesterday because they were just focusing on the battle for third between Mark and Alex. And when I seen just Martin sliding off, I, I couldn't believe it. I actually like I shouted. I was like, I just screamed, oh my God, he's Christ. Like, yeah, I, I, I can't believe it happened like that. But like I say, Mark, Mark has a, a weekend for him that, it's really what could have been, isn't it, Pete, when you think about it now? He comes from P13 to P2 in the Grand Prix, and you're like, that is an incredible result. But it really started to go wrong on Friday, didn't it, with that massive crisis that he had at turn 11. I mean, he'll be ruined that. But, yeah, the qualifying, what happened with Stefan Braddle, not being able to get his last lap in Q1, having the fight through in the sprint to sixth, which was a good ride, but... He really gritted his teeth yesterday and went for it, didn't he? He did, yes. And, uh, you, you know, it wasn't, I think, was his words, really. Uh, throw in the technical yeah. issues as well, wasn't there? There was... So the base, he'd probably get them both working properly and everything else. So it was just one thing on top of another, and it all seemed to be working against him. And uh, great recovery in the sprint, as you say, but I think a lot of people would have said it on a podium on Sunday, but... Uh, you know, he said he felt better when he woke up on, on less pain from the ribs. The finger that was broken didn't really bother him too much, he said, but the ribs was an issue. Felt a bit better, loaded himself up with a cocktail of painkillers and uh, and off he went, didn't he? So, uh, yeah, he certainly had the speed there again and um, to win. And it, it is just a shame that we didn't get to see the three of those three guys fighting at the front as we as we thought, didn't we? But he thought that would be those three guys, the three guys top of the championship would be the guys of this weekend fighting for the win. And uh, certainly pace-wise, that was the case. But starting from 13th, there's only, what, two or three pace places a lap to pass at Saxon Ring. So to try yeah. and gain on those other guys. And you've got the tyre pressure issues, haven't you, with the runner when you're running behind people in a pack. We saw the penalties after the race, which sort of underlines that, that it is a tyre pressure race in the sense that it is making a difference. So teams are risking a little bit more. 
So coming through the pack is always going to be difficult. But uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, as you say, the Morbidelli incident in the race as well, breaking the screen, deploying the airbag. It was just one thing after another. But uh, yeah, the, the win record is broken now, isn't it? As far as the Sunday, the Sunday win, should we say, never been defeated before did, yeah. in MotoGP, but that's gone. But then, as you say, a unique achievement in, in standing on the podium with his brother. So, uh, you know, he said he comes out of, yeah. out of the Saxon ring with a, a memorable occasion. Yeah, and he said, Rob, that it felt almost felt like a win for him because he was on the podium with his brother. The seems are really cool to see. And they were over. I mean, Grissini are probably still partying right now. Like I think the whole just atmosphere they had. It was one of those nice moments about a GP and rare moment because yeah, we've had brothers in the past, and it, it's it's tough because Mark even said that for this year to be in a dry race, to be against all the GP twenty fours as well, that Alex had a strong weekend. For him to be on the podium with him, pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it was, like you said, definitely a feel-good sort of story and, and to see them both celebrating because Mark has always championed for, for Alex Marquez and said how good a rider he is. And he's always, you've sort of seen that joy when his brother's done well. I remember when Alex Marquez won the Moto2 World title, the scenes of Marquez in pit lane cheering him on. So definitely, you know, for them to, to achieve that podium together, and on merit for both of them, but more impressively for, for Alex, because we've not sort of seen that form. You know, we saw it sporadically last season. I remember you won the Silverstone sprint where he was amazing. And he had a few other races, but we've not really seen it that much this year. Um, but he showed potential from Friday, sort of built on that and was really, really strong. Um, so to see them both, you know, on the podium and the first brothers in uh, what 27, is it? 27 years. years yeah. Since the brothers did it. Yeah. To do Emma, that. So, yeah. yeah. Pretty pretty special, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. Um, amazing achievement. And obviously from from Mark Marquez's point of view, you know, for him to secure that podium after everything that happened on, on Friday. I mean, I don't think we've seen a, a wilder second practice on a Friday afternoon yeah. for some time. I mean it's crashes galore at one point. Um but to come back and to, to be setting what was it, low to mid one twenty ones in the last part of that race was phenomenal pace and the way he caught Alex after sort of finally getting from Morbidelli that was the trouble for, for Marquez yeah. was getting past Morbidelli once he did he caught Alex so quickly and you thought that that was going to knock Alex off the podium unfortunately but then came the the huge error from Martin so it allowed them to both be on the, the podium and another Ducati top three which is just incredible form from from them as a brand is, as well. Yeah, and two GP23s on the podium as well. So, you know, that, that just shows that bike is still still working perfectly. Yeah, as Rob mentioned, Pete, the, the more of a of Marquez, uh, Mark Marquez, he says, like, that kicked them into gear almost. I'm like, who needs to be sent through their screen and the airbag to go off for them to wake up? It's like, uh, yeah. But more of a to that point, he had a very strong race and he had closed the gap I was looking back, he closed the gap to four attempts in second place to Martin yesterday, and he was right there fighting for the lead, but then dropped off. But a very strong weekend for, for him. I, I'm quite impressed by him. Yeah, I think I think you could say uh, Morbidelli, probably along with Oliveira, um, were the surprises of the weekend, weren't they, in terms of people that really stepped up. And uh, yeah, Morbidelli was <laughs> was certainly uh, getting his elbows out, wasn't he? He ran a bit wide into that corner. I think he'd done it the lap before did, as well, yeah. certainly previously, and, and, and Mark had backed out of it. But on that occasion, he thought, you know, I'm I'm far enough by here. But still, there was the tangle. And as you say, to break your screen and then do it with, uh, with badly bruised ribs as well is uh, it's, it's, not, yeah. it's not the easiest thing to uh, to recover from and a deployed airbag, of course. So, um, yeah, as you say, it just it seemed to flick a switch with him. And he was like, right, you know, all in and away we go. And, and, and he charged up and passed Bastianini, who he dropped behind, didn't he? And then Morbidelli as well, and then his brother. So it was a real strong charge at the end of the race from him. And uh, yeah, just a pity it wasn't for the victory because that would have that would have been a great battle between those three, as we say. But uh, but yeah, for Mark, I mean, uh, okay, we go into the summer break without a win on the Ducati, which I think you know a lot of people wouldn't have expected. Um, but of course, having that Ducati contract already for next year kind of takes the edge or, or the urgency off that, doesn't it? Yeah. Because he, he, you know, if he didn't have that in his pocket, I think there would be more pressure on him to get a win and really prove that he can, you know, he is back to his best. But, uh, you know, he knows his future is settled. He knows he's going to be on the best bike next year and almost certainly, you know, fighting for race wins every weekend. So I think under those circumstances, uh, as you guys have been saying, to take a podium with his brother, you know, it's hard to I mean, what other satellite team 
really can realistically expect to have two riders on a podium this year be the only occasion it happens. So, uh, you know, good on the Grassini team for doing it. And, uh, and yeah, good on them as well. Yeah, a, a very good weekend for the Grassini team after a very difficult start to the weekend. But yeah, seemed a bit of pressure went off Alex Marquez. I think now that the contract's been signed, kind of noticed that riding a bit more freely. Yeah, good on him getting up there because I, I see some comments sometimes that people kind of doubt that Alex Marquez's talent isn't there. I mean, when you're a two-time world champion in the lower classes and you have one motor GP sprint races, yeah, I mean, people forget as well that rookie year on that Honda. He had two incredible podiums as well. So he's got a lot of talent and I'm always happy to see him up there because, yeah, he celebrates like he's won, wins world championships. And I love it. It's it's brilliant. So, yeah, hopefully the Marquez brothers uh, will probably have got hangovers this morning. Who knows what, what they've got. But a good end of the summer break or a good start of the summer break for them. And as Pete touched on, Rob, a good weekend for the satellite Aprilia team. So Trackhouse, I mean, looking at the first, uh, well, second and third on the front row, brilliant from Oliveira and Fernandez, but Oliveira being the real strong case in the sprint with a second place. And it looked like he could actually have challenged Martin, just missing that wee bit for the win. But yeah, good to see Miguel Oliveira deliver around the track that he does like. His last dry podium came around the Saxon Ring in 2021 on the KTM, so showing that he likes the circuit too. Yeah, a brilliant weekend, like you said, from Oliveira. Um, a track that he obviously goes well at, like you said, 2021. He was the guy who pushed Marquez that that year. Um, and, you know, I, I think we'd probably all say finally that we've seen Oliveira click with that Aprilia. It's been a long time coming, and it's good to see that form um, again, like he had at KTM, where he was able to, to win some races as well. So to see Oliveira do that in a time that he needed it, obviously when you know his future's up in the air and you know there's that Pramac Yamaha sort of option that's potentially dangling. For Oliveira, it was a huge weekend because we'd seen the flashes from Raul Fernandez. So to see, but I mean, firstly, to see them both on the front row was very impressive. To out-qualify, I know Vinales had those two yeah. crashes on Saturday. Um, one in the practice, so his qualifying was a bit of a mess because of it. But to see them, you know, lead a pretty sort of um, performance was in very, very impressive. And like you said, in the sprint, Oliveira, you know, there was that moment where he was sort of battling with Martin and Banyaya, and he dropped down to, to third, I think it was. And you thought, oh, maybe this is where Oliveira would just sort of slide back. But he was aggressive and came back through on Banyaya. And then again in the race yesterday, he was battling Martin on the first couple of laps, trying to find a way through. So there was a lot of aggressiveness from him again, which was good to see that he was confident enough with the bike to do that. And, he, you know, we've got to say he was the only non-Ducati to be, you know, a challenger yeah. yesterday and to be a force in that race. The KTMs were nowhere. Pit Byra spoke before the race saying they need to do better for their riders. And it showed again in the Grand Prix. They were, they were nowhere really, but Oliveira was... You know, he dropped down to about 10 seconds behind at the at the flag. But in the early laps, he was really, really holding his own. Um, and just good to see, because when Oliveira is at his best, you know, he is a very, very good rider, a top-level rider. So to see him back where he belongs was good. Ralph Fernandez, you know, sort of went backwards in both races. The sprint was alarming. It was a it bit was strange quick, to quick. pretty much in, yeah. in 15 laps to lose nearly 15 positions. It, it was almost average of one, uh, one position dropped a lap. So... Ralph Nunes will be scratching his head a little bit, but yeah, good good weekend for Trackhouse. By far their best showing of the of the season, which will be positives going into the, the second half of the season. Yeah, and going into that second half of the season, Ralph Fernandez will actually get the GP24 at Silverstone. That's what we're led to believe. So yeah, all the factory Aprilia riders and all the Trackhouse riders now we on the same machinery, essentially. So let's see how that goes for them. But uh, Oliver, I think it seemed to be that they maybe had found something that's made him more comfortable on the Aprilia. It would led to believe that it was the rear brake, really. It's kind of been uh, a comfortable position. I heard that maybe they'd switched to a Maverick Vinales sort of setup that he uses the sort of scooter brake on his, his left hand. And it seems that Oliver has went that way. And it kind of, it's really worked, hasn't it? Yeah, he definitely, it all clicked into place, didn't it? Yeah, he it seems that he's been having a similar problem to Maverick with the braking into the corners on a certain side. I, I don't know if they've actually been able to put that special brake onto uh, Oliveira's bike, the one that sort of switches between the clutch and yeah. uh, and the rear brake. But certainly, you know, he wants it because that would be a step. It seemed like just sort of suspension changes, maybe some electronics. And of course, 
some of the Laish's team actually went over and, and helped out Oliveira, didn't they? Laish obviously withdrawing yeah. on the, uh, early on, on Friday morning. So uh, a lot of the Aprilia engineers were then able to, to, to go and help. So maybe that all those things combined sort of made the difference. But uh, as you guys have been saying, I mean, let's be honest, it would have been an all Ducati top six if Martin hadn't fallen. As it was, it was a top five, which is big enough. But, you know, the step that they've got over all the others, it, it really... It was impressive by Oliveira in the sprint, but then come Sunday afternoon, suddenly we see the Ducatis again, don't we? They all rise to the top. They yeah. all find something by, by the Sunday afternoon. Uh, I think Fernandez was saying he thought even after warm-up, you know what, Miguel can, can race with the Ducatis today. But when it, when it comes to the race, it's like they only, it, I think it was Oliveira said, it's like they only sort of really reveal what they've got when, it, when the Grand Prix comes around. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he just couldn't stay with them. But it was still, as you guys have been saying, a, a break to ride, really. I mean, does it make it difficult for him now, though, to, to pick for next year? You know, having uh, having now suddenly got the speed on the Aprilia, just as we go into the summer break, when potentially he has to make a decision on his future, and uh, uh, as Rob was saying, potentially that the Pramac Yamaha seat. Now, what do you do? It would always be an easier choice, isn't it? If if, so if it, things had stayed the same and uh, he hadn't been able to get the speed on the Aprilia, but he's shown that he can do it, and uh, everyone knows what a class rider he is. All the wins on the KTM, so yeah, he's got some big decisions to make for his future, and. Uh, but yeah, good for the team. I think Ralph Fernandez, I think tyre pressure was, was the big one, certainly on Saturday. Yeah. I think that was why he, he dropped right through the field. He was just another one of those guys that the front tyre pressure went sky high and, and that was it sort of thing. So yeah, that, 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 I think that was a big part of him sort of slipping down the order. But track house, great for them, as you guys are saying, two bikes on the front row and uh, it, it did shake things up. It, you know, it, it shook the order up a bit. But as we say, come the, come the end of Sunday's race and uh, it's all the Ducatis at the top again. Yeah, nice to see so it's uh, just different up there it, it was really cool and for a new team like Pete says that to have that look and just to be up there and set the top three motor gp brilliant and it's only gonna i think get more eyes on the american audience too they're gonna look at that and go oh, look at that there's a uh, there's an american bike essentially there but the colors of it look at that yeah brilliant to see and i hope that they continue strong form in the silverstone which oliver had last year thinking back he was very strong uh, in the race as the conditions change, but let's see what they can do. Aprilia uh, factory team, Rob, Mark Vignales, we touched on it there. Uh, oh my, it reminded me of Jorge Lorenzo's crash in 2013 at the Saxon Ring, that, that nasty high set that he had at the top of the waterfall, well, just before it, it really knocked him about. And he actually was still quite strong in the sprint, just got pipped to the line by Mar Marquez. It was like three thousandths of a second, which was a good viewing on TV. But in the Grand Prix, he looked pretty comfortable, and then he had a massive moment that he had to save. And it seemed that I think maybe Maverick had just went and said, "You know what? I don't want to crash again, so let's just just get it over the line." But a, a bit of a, a good weekend, but kind of really stopped by the crashes that he had. Yeah, it was definitely, I think, you know, a, a what if type of weekend for Vinales because, you know, the lap record he set on Friday was very impressive. You know, and again, we talk about, Pete made a great point about how Ducati seemed to sort of rise to the occasion on the on Sunday. But Vinales looked like maybe he would have had enough for them. And it was looking a little bit on Friday, at least like a sort of Kota yeah. performance. He was very, very dominant in that second practice. Uh, and, and it looked like with ease as well. Um but then obviously it started it was a nightmare start to Saturday that the crash, I think it turned 10, like you said, just at the top of the waterfall was, was huge because it was not only the, the jolt of the high side, but then he obviously got hit as he yeah. was sort of coming over the front of the bike into his sort of midsection. Um, just a brutal, brutal crash. Uh, and for Vinales, who's a rider that I think, you know, everything needs to be working perfectly. So any sort of loss in confidence or a big crash like that, it can have a big effect. In fairness to him, we have to give sort of big kudos to the way he responded in the sprint. He was always there in the battle for, for sort of the top five. And like you said, just got beat by Mark Marquez over the line. Um, so, it, you know, a good salvage job con considering how Saturday started. You know, he seemed to have decent pace in the Grand Prix. But, I mean, I don't know if it was motocross yeah. or... Oh, what he was trying to do through the gravel. I mean, fair play yeah. for staying on. It was it was tough for you to watch, actually. It looked like it could have been a, a massive, um, massive shunt because the, with, with Saxon Ring being the way it is, you saw it even with the crashes at Turn 1. If you go in the quick, yeah, you're in the, barrier, the barriers yeah. come up on you very, very quickly. Um, and we saw Dijon Antonio's bike sort of land yeah. on the air fence. And the way Vinales was approaching 
the barrier on the outside there. He had to sort of save it in the nick of time and he did. So, um, and then he still came forward a bit after that in the race. So good pace and, you know, points at the end of the day. A shame because I think, I think Vinales could have been the rider to really challenge Ducassi on Sunday if the weekend had gone, gone to yeah, plan. Yeah, I think so too. And it's just, like you say, Maverick has kind of what if weekends. I don't, it really wasn't his fault here. I think purely just of the absolute, tr- like the blood force trauma, that Christ that he had was just no injuries really, but just really sore after that one. And yeah, really de- just destabilize his weekend. And I think he can hold his head high going up after looking at what he's done last year compared to this year. I think the way he's adapted to the Aprilia, I think he's been brilliant. So yeah, Maverick Vignal is a story of what could have been, but. No record for Pedro Acosta, the youngest ever winner in MotoGP. Mar- Marquez has that title for, I don't know how long, whoever's going to come through and maybe take it. But as Rob said, K- KTM, they just look a bit lost at the minute. They're they're kind of just stuck around the outskirts of the top 10. And they're just having issues, aren't they, with rear grip and tyres. And it just seems that the bike just isn't really playing ball, is it? That's right, yeah, they, they, the, the podiums have dried up, haven't they, since Cota, certainly in the Grand Prix races, okay, same for Aprilia, but at least Aprilia and the sprints have been strong, haven't they, whereas KTM, it's just, it seems like they're missing something, and uh, as Rob said earlier, Pit Byra has sort of admitted to that and said, look, we need to sort the tools out, we need to make, give the guys uh, a better machinery here, and uh, yeah, I think it, it, this, they seem to be searching for sort of balance with the bike, Jack Miller was struggling with the front, but then in the, sort of fix that for the Grand Prix, but then he had problems Maria. with the the lean angle on the right hand corners with the rear so it's it's sort of these different these different issues that they're having and they're, they're sort of chasing around trying to find grip really just they need more grip and uh, and that kind of thing um acosta i think he had a bit of a battle with raul a bit of contact early in the race and things like that so that yeah i mean he, as you say as far as the record it, it was sort of really from friday wasn't, yeah. it wasn't looking like it was going to be ktm's weekend so it would have been a, a big ask and I, I think probably the well the most the stat that probably sums it up is that Miller was basically exactly the same speed-wise, time-wise, during the Grand Prix race as he was last year. And, uh, you know, he was the top KTM last year, so it's not like he had a bad a bad race yeah. last year. So that shows where they are at the moment. They need to find something. I think, as he was saying, they need to develop the bike. The bike is still... They're still using the, the sort of the first evolution of the carbon fiber chassis from Mizano last year. That was obviously fast-tracked in because it was really the 2024 frame, but it was brought in early when it did so well with Pedroza. But it seems like that you know he's feeling they're they're kind of at the limit with some of these parts. The engine's strong, the aero's strong, but they are lacking grip. You know they need to they need to make the next step with the bike. Um, I think Paul Espargaro is out testing privately, obviously. Um, I, I think this week. So uh, yeah, there'll be a, I'm sure a long list of things for him to go through to try and find some answers. Because surprise, isn't it? We all thought from the start of the year that the first two or three rounds that uh, yeah. you know KTM this this could be their year. You know they're really up there and they're up there with more than one rider. You know Costa. Brad Binder, Jack occasionally, um, but it's all sort of yeah you know they definitely they dropped behind not only Ducati but uh, but uh, Aprilia as well haven't they in the last couple of races and uh, they'll need to redress that. Yeah, do, do you think Rob that the the summer brace came at the right time for KTM to just to reset or do you think they would wish there was a few more races just to try and get their heads around just the, like just Pete says the balance of the bike it seems that it's just you fix one area and then you have another issue at the other side it's just it's maybe going to be a blessing for them that they have a bit of time off to kind of reevaluate. Yeah, I, yeah, I I think it is. I think it's it's a break that they needed, uh, and I think the riders sort of needed it. They um, hinted at it after the race. Acosta did himself um, that you know they they need to basically use all this information that they've gathered over the last few rounds because to Pete's point, perfect point to make is that. You know, we saw how strong Binder was in Qatar, you know, and we were talking of, could he be a championship contender on yeah. that KTM? And then Acosta, obviously, in Portimao was extremely uh, impressive. Same in Cota. And and there were signs there that not only were Acosta and Binder getting the most out of the bike, right. that the bike was one that could challenge Ducati. But then in recent rounds, it's, you know, it's really sort of fallen off a cliff. And at times, the riders have been lost in terms of why that's happened. Um and Pit Byra has spoke, you know, it's great to hear from Pit Byra because he's someone who doesn't really mince his words. Um, but we're hearing too often that the bike, you know, we need to make changes yeah. or the riders aren't getting the best out of the bike. The bike's not allowing the riders 
you know to get the best out of it that that's all well and fine if that's what's going on but we're hearing it too much because ktm you know they've got all the resources they've got like pete said they've got a very good aero package they've got a very very strong engine that engine on on the straights is just as good as the ducati if not better at times so they've they've got and they've got the people in that team as well they've got everything they need they've got top level riders they've got top level engineers and people within that team and the finance to be challenging ducati but for what every reason every year it's sort of they mm-hmm. start off quite well and then it's sort of petering out and, and, and we don't know why um so i think this summer break they've really got to get on top of it not for this year because hopes of you know being in the championship this year are gone not but not. they've got to start strong next year they're going to have their best yeah. lineup ever next year and they've got to take advantage of that so building the bike and getting it right for 2025 is what i think they need to start doing now um, and it's going to be a very important second half of the year for KTM. It is. It is. Pete, what do you think of KTM? Do, do you think that there's a... They may be a bit disappointed with how it's gone, obviously, but do you think the break is a good thing for them? As you said, Paul will test a few things, and maybe that'll be a breakthrough for them, or do you think that it'll... Hopefully that they can get it sorted, but it doesn't maybe look like it will be straight away maybe it'll take a few rounds after the summer break to to get back to where they were yeah i think it, it does come at a good time for them this break because now they're just going to have to pour over all the data aren't they looking for answers as to where they're where they're losing out now or, or you know what exactly has happened here because uh yeah you know they were looking so good they looked like they were consistently strong which is the one thing that, that they've been lacking wasn't it the consistency we saw that in the early rounds they were up there repeatedly uh, and, and it's it's just slipped away, and um, we've seen, as, as we say, the Aprilia kind of emerge as the next best bike to the Ducati, but nobody's really seriously challenging the Ducatis by the Sunday. So everyone's playing catch up at the moment. But uh, yeah, certainly I think for KTM, they uh, they need to find something, don't they? What was Bagnaia twelve seconds quicker than yeah. than the previous uh, the twenty three race? You know, that's the rate that the Ducati is improving. So if you want to catch those guys, you've got to do even better than that. And um, yeah, th- there's a lot of work they need to do. That, when you've got the, the riders that they've got and all of them, even Acosta, I mean, as he said, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't a disaster weekend, but it wasn't a good weekend. You know, he stressed. He, he had a decent sort of salvaged, what was it, in the end? Uh, seventh place, wasn't yeah. it? But I mean, that would have been eighth if Martin hadn't have crashed. You know, it's 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 a long way from where he was at the start of the year when he was up there fighting for the podiums, leading in Cota and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely, I think there's some, some head scratching as to what exactly has gone wrong. And, uh, and of course, we'll, KTM wise, we also heard that, that Fabiano Stellachini yeah. is, is leaving, which was a, a bit of a surprise. Um, that his well, his contract won't be renewed. He, he joined in, uh, in in June a few years back, and uh, seems they haven't been able to agree a new contract. So uh, again, that, that nobody was really expecting that. You know, very highly experienced uh, engineer at Ducati for many years, who'd sort of been heading the road racing project at KTM. So that's that's another change that's going to go on behind the scenes as well. But uh, you know, a more immediate concern will be, as you guys have said, to get get the testing going and get the data analysis at the factory to really get to the root of the problem. And it's the grip and turning. That seems to be what they're lacking. As you guys have said, the aero, the engine, that's not so bad. But, you know, they're just they're, they're losing in some clear areas compared to uh, Ducati and now Aprilia. Yeah, exactly. And yes, for well, let's see what KTM have to do. Uh, I like you say, over the summer break, it's not really going to probably be a break for many people because they'll be working, looking at things and trying to solve just how to get around issues but yeah ktm a lot of work to do over the summer and let's see how they go in the second half of this year just going sort of off track i want to talk with fabio did antonio rob it looks like from reports from motorsport and autosport that he will stay with vr46 for the next two years but the key thing being he will get the latest spec bike next year nothing is official yet and no doubt it probably will be today or tomorrow maybe this week, that he will stay with them and be the third and last latest factory rider kind of for Ducati heading into next year, which is really deserved, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a very well-deserved deal for Dijan Antonio. I think, you know, his performances in recent rounds especially have been very impressive. He's sort of, you know, something we didn't expect is he's, took on that leader role in that team yeah. just because of performances alone because Bezeki's having such a difficult period but Di Antonio has been there and he's you know in Aston he was challenging Mark as sort of the top GP23 
Um, you know, and this weekend with his massive crash he had in free practice or in practice two on Friday, you know, it's oh, sort of God. the way he got up, holding his collarbone, it looked like that could be yeah. the end of his weekend. And sort of, you know, for the next few rounds, it could have been, you know, a very sort of difficult situation for him. But wow. to come back and put a good performance in, and now it seems like he's going to be rewarded with that that deal, which not only to get the GP25, which is huge, um, and it's huge for that team, but to be on a two-year deal, which will put him in line with the top riders in MotoGP, Banyaya, Martin, Mar Marquez, you know, he'll be end of 2026, he can sort of, on the same machinery, show what he can do. And then, you know, that could open up a factory yeah. ride in the future for him. So, um, you know, from this this time last year where Digi Antonio, you know, it looked like he might be out of MotoGP altogether before he sort of turned his form around in the second half of the year. To now be going into next season with the with Valentino Rossi's team again on a two-year deal and set to get a GP25 bike. It shows the turnaround he's done in a year, which is extremely impressive, but well yeah. deserved. Yeah, we, we said it before, but I think he's like the most underrated rider of MotoGP, and he has a bit of a chip on his shoulder because no one really kind of they always kind of overlook him. And I think it's yeah for a character like the John Antonio, really likable. He's always speaks really well to the media. Comes across really humble. Really happy for him because he, it's stories like this that you know, as Rob said, he was out of MotoGP last year, replaced by Mar- Marquez. A tough pill to swallow and he goes on that run that he did last year wins races gets podiums it's like a brilliant and he's adapted to the gp23 second best really to mark marquez and and for ducati look at that and to go we're going to change our approach and, and to reward you and they let's be honest they don't want to lose him maybe the yamaha because that was the top fabio quadraro really pushing yamaha just he was almost acting as like an agent for the john antonio uh, on Thursday, and it, it kind of shows here that Ducati want to keep him because he's a real valuable asset, isn't he? He's definitely proving to be, isn't he? Yeah, I think uh, no one really knew, was he? You know, joining the, the VR46 team, but not being a member of the academy, the first guy to go in that team and, and sort of be a bit of an outsider, who's obviously still yeah. an Italian, everything else, but it, it was by no means guaranteed that you'd settle completely into that and that he'd be able to do what he did at Grassini, of course, when he was working with Frankie Carcetti during his second year, which he sort of credited as the big change, wasn't it, after that difficult rookie mm-hmm. year that he had. Um, so there were lots of question marks over whether Digio would be able to do, you know, the sort of amazing performances that he did at the end of last year. But yeah, he's, he's showing his quality as a rider. He's showing that he can do it on a, on let's face it, what is quite a tricky bike sometimes, that GP23, isn't it? You only have to look at Bastianini's step up yeah. in performance this year. Now he's got off that 23 and onto the 24 which it, it seems, from what the riders say, is much closer to the handling of the 22 bike um, than, uh, than than sort of the 23 was, which was quite different. So, yeah, you know, he's gone on top of it. He showed he can be adaptable. He can get used to a new team, a completely new team, you know, crew chiefs, everything, the lot of VL46. And uh, it looks like he'll be rewarded, as you say, and uh, g- good for him. Um, and, g- and just generally, uh, you were speaking about the three bikes at Ducati, the three factory bikes. I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? If that's the case, then Ducati might be the only factory with only three factory that's bikes. That's quite incredible. Every isn't other it? manufacturer <laughs> will actually have four. Yeah. Right? yeah. So you'd end up with okay, they'll have the most bikes on the grid, of course, six, but potentially, and you can see why. I think it was Pecco might have raised this that he was kind of pushing to keep yep. four, and and maybe that's why because they aren't the same, are they? When you've got a year old bike, there's some things that obviously you can transfer across and. Maybe you get information about the tyres, that kind of thing. But there's certain other things that are just different and mm-hmm. you can't directly compare. So, you know, maybe that will be a bit of a bit of an, a concern for the some of the factory Ducati guys that, uh, you know, the other the other factories, they're going to have four factory bikes out there. We might only have three. So uh, let, let's see what happens there. But uh, as things stand now, as you say, uh, Jordan, it'll be the factory bike. Basically, VR46 will take over that Pramac yeah. role, won't they? They'll the, have the factory bike. They'll be the official satellite team, if you like, and... Um, Obviously, Aldegar has got to be slotted in somewhere as well. He's got a contract, and then we've got to see what happens as uh, for the other ride. Obviously, Morbidelli at Pramac, he's going to need yeah. to go somewhere else, and uh, we'll see what happens there. And at the moment, Alex Marquez, of course, needs a new team. Yeah. So uh, those are the seats still available. Yeah, and it kind of seems that Morbidelli might just start in at VR46 and continue on the, the 24, just because the bike he knows already. Just give him another year on that. That seems logical. And Fermin Aldegar will then go to Grassini. That's my thinking. All the GP twenty four alongside Alex, let him build up in his 
his rookie year. And of course, he won yesterday as well So in Moto2. So I think Gigi Caddy will announce something maybe in the next week or so. But yeah, it seems a bit more clearer. And I think we're all grateful for that for the rider market because it was a bit of a, how could we put it? It was a bit of a minefield. And it was just, yeah, we were trying to piece everything together. But it seems very clear now. Of course, there's still prominent Yamaha seats to decide. And who knows what Yamaha are going to do? What direction will they go in? Will they go for the Moto2 riders? Or will they try and grab experience and a bit of both? So, yeah, that's pretty much it, folks. We've covered a lot from the German Grand Prix. And it's a summer break now. But that means we'll have plenty to talk about still over the summer break. Last question to you both. The top three in the World Championship. Paco Bagnaia, Jorge Martin and Mar- Marquez. Give me a score out of 10 on how you think their season has went to the summer break. Rob, we'll start with you. Uh, Jorge Martin, we'll start with. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that one. What do you think his score is? If you'd asked me this before yesterday's race, it would have been higher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yesterday was a big a big dent just for a lot of reasons. Um, I think my score out of 10, because he's still been extremely good, would be an eight. Okay. Pete, what's your score for Martin? Yeah, I'm going with Rob on that. Mm-hmm. And, and I did also, I, I did already have that, but yeah, I think, I think an eight is fair. I think, uh, obviously the timing of the mistake, it makes you yeah. sort of focus on that because it's just happened. But, it, but if we thought, you know, start of the year, by the summer break, Martin's only 10 points behind Peko. I think most, you know, given the second half of the year that he had last year as well, where he was particularly strong, I think that that uh, you know just a ten point gap, we'd be saying oh, that's that's pretty solid. Obviously, far from perfect, but uh, but yeah, I, th- I think I think eight out of ten would be fair. Yeah, I'm gonna give him a little decimal point. I'm gonna give him an eight point five. So uh, it would have been a nine if it wasn't for the mistake yesterday. But I still think it, for the amount of mistakes that he's had, well, I can think of three really. He's had the crash in the sprint at Mugello, and then he crashed in the lead at uh, Jerez, and then yesterday, obviously. So three mistakes but they're quite costly because Bagnaia's just kind of yeah if Marquez had a one of those races say but it's always been Bagnaia for Martin he's always just losing points and I think 8.5 is far I think it would have been a 9 though yeah Pete what about Bagnaia I, I think Patico's score could change so much but the current one of form he's on I've got a <laughs> number in my head that I think all of us will probably have What what's your score for him Oh, I don't. Well, I, I'm going to go with your 8.5 okay. for Paco. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the, I think the Barcelona sprint run was a surprise yeah. as, as far as a negative. I, I think that the difference there was he wasn't, you know, he was under no pressure, was he? I mean, there, there was no one anywhere near him. So that, that was a surprise. And I think also maybe the Portimao, the tangle with Marquez, I thought that was a little yeah. bit unnecessary. So um, I, I think with that in mind, but then really since then, he's been pretty much perfect. I think he gave himself 9 out of 10, didn't he? in the press conference yesterday. So, so yeah, I mean, don't listen to me. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, <laughs> he's, uh, you know, he's leading the World Championship at the summer break. But I think, again, if you try and, I was trying to think, what would you have thought at the start of the year? And to be honest, I would have thought he would have bigger had a leads. bigger lead by this yeah. point. Yeah, and so that's the reason why I'll, I'll, I'll say well, What's your score for Paco? A nine. What, what he rated himself as. Uh, I think, like Pete said, those... Portimao was unnecessary for sure um, and obviously the sprint in Catalonia which you know crashing out of the lead on the last lap was pretty disastrous um, one race I look at as well Cota being you know last season he had the pace to win but this year he never yeah. really showed that so that was a bit of a, a strange sort of change um, and I think he was fifth in that race so that wasn't a great weekend for him but I think a lot of his rating goes up based on the last four weekends, you know, to win the last four Grand Prix, um, you know, and to win pretty much every sprint as well. It's um, It's been an incredible turnaround. And, you know, Martin being only 10 points behind, Pete made a great point. If, Part- if Martin can show the same form as he did last season in the second half of the year, Martin could overturn yep. this. But the form Bang is in right now is alarming and it's even better than 2018. 20- 2022 and last season in my opinion so I think the way Banya is going right now it could very quickly become a 10 out yeah, of 10 and I want to give him a 9 purely because in 2022 he did go on that 4 Grand Prix win streak and he's done it again like at the perfect time 
before the summer break and he's kind of never had that before and I think it's different because he's he's came for a lot this year I think of them run a sprint race that he had where there was like you get tangled with was it Bender and then he had that weird race in Le Mans where the bike was just simply trying to throw him off and he reset from that and came back mm. and I've been really impressed him a nine I think is is what I would give him like he like you say give himself that but like to your point Pete I would have thought he would have had a bigger lead in the World Championship by now if he had have looked at it from the start of the year and it just shows doesn't it how good Jorge Martin has been too and yeah let's see what Pete could do in the second half of the year he usually gets stronger and it'll be fun to look back at what we give these riders at the end of the year let's see if we could score them again so yeah and then Pete Mark Marquez, what would you give his his first half of well, not really a half until the summer break on the Ducati? What would what would you rate his his season so far? I think I'd go with eight out of ten. Um, I think I, which might have been what he gave himself yeah. yesterday. I can't quite remember. Was it? Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. I think that's fair enough. Obviously, the the big negative, if you like, is that that we're still waiting for that win, aren't we? Um, but otherwise, but but that really is the only thing. Everything else has been a positive for him. He's been back to 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 the old Marquez in terms of the speed, the enjoyment of racing, everything else. He's got the factory Ducati contract. Um, he's still in the championship fight, of course, isn't he? As well, he's still you know okay. It's we're, we're, because of the the change with the the, the sprint races coming in. It, it, we've got to get our heads around the fact that bigger gaps are actually not as They're big not, as they no. as they used to be, are they? So uh, you know he's still within two Grand Prix, if you like, two Grand Prix weekends of the title lead, um, which can easily change around. You know, one DNF or something. But um, the the trouble that he's got is got is that he's racing against two guys, and w- the perfect example on Sunday. So when one of them crashes yeah, out and so loses a load of it. points uh, the other one picks them up so the, the sort of the gap to the top is sort of maintaining about the same isn't it but you know let's be realistic he's in a sapphite team he's on a year old bike it, it's a big ass to fight for the world championship under those circumstances so really this year has just all been about Marquez getting back to the front being competitive and, and, in, and in a way setting himself up for next year and, and he's ticked all the boxes there so yeah, I think, you know, 8 out of 10. And, and let's see what the second half of the season brings. You know, maybe with some updates. Of course, they'll all have error, error yep. updates. That'll change things a bit. At any time you put a new part on the bike, isn't it? It's going to suit one rider more than the other. So we just got to wait and see on that. And let's see what the updates, when they, they get over to the 23s, what happens then. So, yeah, I think uh, it'll be a surprise if Marquez doesn't win this year. But uh, but either way, I think it's 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 already been a success for him. An, an overwhelming success. Yeah, it has robbed it. Are you going to agree with Pete? Are you going to give him an 8 or are you going to give him higher? I'm going to agree with Pete. Same score 8, which is the same score for, for Martin as well. Um, obviously, completely different seasons and the way you know, you're know you grading them to give them an 8. But I think for Marquez, like Pete said, the only sort of negative on his um, sort of CV this year is to not have a win. But for me, I think why I'm re- re- scoring him so highly is the comeback rise. Yeah. Those performances, you know, in Le Mans, Jerez, this weekend, just incredible comebacks, which were signs of Mar Marquez being back his best. Um, and we've spoke about it on a previous podcast. The only rider who has, in my opinion, the same sort of ability as Banyaya to put what might have happened on a Saturday behind him and come back fighting on a Sunday. And not only was it the Q1 exit that he had to sort of overturn, but it was the injuries he had to overturn this weekend. And he came back and put in an amazing performance yesterday, had the pace to win. So for Marquez in the second half of the year, it's just, it's changing those weekends where he could have won to actually winning. But that that's the only thing he, he needs to do. I think he's been brilliant on that bike. His first year on a Ducati, you know, I don't think we ever really doubted that he was going to be able to change from the Honda onto another brand but until he actually did it those questions were there and he's gone from the honda and been exceptional this year on on the year old bike and it, it's taken banyaya and martin being in the best form of their life to be ahead of marquez in the championship and it's still not ahead of him by that yeah that much so i think marquez has been exceptional yeah, no, i agree with everything you've both said i'm actually gonna give him 8.5 i'm gonna well, match him with martin because the reason I think it's because Ducati have looked at it and they've went, well, if he's doing this on the 23, I never rewarded him with the factory bike, which seemingly was Martin's 
it looked like it was always going to be his. And the fact that Marquez has came in and had this run so far, yeah, not won a Grand Prix. And I think the big one for him not winning could have got that sprint race in in her F. I think, I mean, damn patches aside, and even the Grand Prix in her F too, it seemed like he kind of surprised himself how fast he was. And he, he always said after he wasn't, didn't really feel like he was ready to win yet. But yeah, I think the win should have came by now. But I think it will come. Where that will be, I I don't know yet because it's it's a different reset, really, isn't it? Second half of the season, go to tracks that Bagnaia likes, go to tracks that Martin likes, but then Marquez also loves Aragon, Phillip Island, Japan. We're in for a a, a brilliant second half of the year, and I can't wait for it. So yeah, my scores eight point five to Marquez and Martin and Bagnaia with the nine. I think that's pretty much everything we've got everything covered we'll rate more riders next week on our podcast and don't forget we'll also bring you that what if episode that so many of you asked for in the comments after we kind of done like a little section that'll come during the summer break as well 